Um, I think I've met most of you before. If not, you know, hi. Uh, I was, uh, I met a professor who is uh, my, my dad sitting here, and he uh, recommended that, you know, this guy is a physicist and mathematician type person, and I'm kind of interested in that type of stuff. So I, he told me to go to his office, and then um, I said, you know, hi. This is my professor last year, and then uh, <clears throat> basically I asked him, no, do you have anything interesting for me to read about or look into? And then uh, he said, well, you know, I'm doing this Lattice Boltzmann simulation stuff. So we're going to, you know, start a PhD. And I was like, cool. I didn't know what it was. I heard about Boltzmann before. But um, basically, that's how I got involved in this. It's a, it's a very relevant topic if you're into simulation and uh, that type of thing. So I thought, you know, I'd do this as an introduction for you guys. If anybody wants to work on uh, simulation, then he's a professor. He's up on the third floor, I think. No, actually, he's moved building now. So I have to go to the Sintef building to talk to him. But um, it's a very active research area and uh, very fun. And uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff. So uh, if you're interested, then talk to me or Ifan. Uh, maybe Indonesian students know him. Uh, Ifan is a fifth year student or second year international student. So he's taking his master's in this. and. Um, some of the animations that I have. Oh, there he is, sitting in the back. Um, so the animations were given by him, uh, some of them. And uh, he's helped me a lot with this. So I'd just like to thank him uh, for his time before we start. So this is what I'm going to try to go through the first lecture. Uh, don't freak out and run out already. But <clears throat> it's just for you guys to have an overview so you can see what you know, we're going through and, you know, if this interests you, then you have a reference so you can look at and go back to. So I thought we'd start with, um, you know, some motivation. What do we want to try to try to simulate? Um, oh, and then some background on, you know, Boltzmann modeling and where it lies in the spectrum of physical hierarchy. And then we um, will go on to. Uh, lattice gas cellular autonoma, or cellular autonoma, um, which is basically just a, a way of doing simulation by a set of rules. Okay, so you have a list of rules or, or some specifications, and then you get a definite output. You get some pretty interesting results. And then the last part is the lattice gas cellular autonoma. So we're going to try to simulate or have a gas like system by using the cellular autonoma. And then in the second lecture, we're going to go more into the lattice Boltzmann modeling. So that's the real meat. Uh, so I'll just you know, name it here, and then we can come back to it later. So here are some of the, uh, I mean, there's a really, really good book by Sukop that I, uh, if you're interested in this topic, then you should look into that book, it tells you kind of like exactly what you need to do to actually implement this method into code. So if you're interested in coding, you have some spare time during the Christmas break, then I could recommend uh, working, looking at this book and working through some of the chapters. Uh, Ifan made a really good note on the lattice gas model that he made, so I recommend that. And if we're lucky, we, we, we might get a paper by Carl Fedek and use these PowerPoint slides. So just to get a, like a mental image of, of how our physics is built. So on the very, very small scale, we have uh, quantum mechanics, which you know, you know, learn about, or but you know, everybody's heard about quantum mechanics, um, how particles act like waves and particles and strange and complicated and the math is heavy and then, but that's, really would be beyond the scope of these lectures. Above that, you have like the Newtonian mechanics for individual particles. So we're talking about atoms and molecules moving at relatively low speeds. Um, but the idea of having 
many small like ball-like atoms moving around and colliding uh, like elastic collisions. That's kind of like the micro scale. And then above that, we have meso. That's basically when you take a large collection of these small little atoms and you say, what happens in the region with a lot of particles? But you're still thinking about them fundamentally as small little balls colliding. And that's where statistical mechanics uh, comes in and lattice Boltzmann modeling comes in. And then above that again, you have thermodynamics and fluid dynamics. And by that, I mean we're trying to solve Navier-Stokes equation for a non-compressible fluid. Pretty heavy duty, but it turns out to be quite simple, uh, lattice Boltzmann modeling. So I just thought it was kind of neat to show you guys the hierarchy of, of physics, basically, of the scaling of physics. So one problem that we can try to solve using the lattice Boltzmann modeling, uh, and it has been done by IFON, and I'm going to show it to you tomorrow, is basically flow around the cylinder. So above and below here, we have uh, like no flow boundaries. And then we have you know, flow at a constant velocity from uh, the left. Then we just have a cylinder. And then we try to look at the pressure or dens density map around the cylinder. And what you see in nature is that you can actually get these uh, eddies, turbulent flows, these circulations you see here. And this is a, a real test. So here you have your cylinder. You have the flow coming in from this direction. And then you get these like uh, swirls behind the flow. This is a very complicated thing to simulate using a finite difference scheme, for example. Turbulent flow is definitely, definitely not easy. Uh, but below, you see the uh, lattice Boltzmann solution taken from the book using a very or somewhat simple code. Uh, probably shouldn't say simple when Nifon's in the room. Spent a lot of hours working on it. But um, it's incredible that we can even try to recreate this like, pretty complicated fluid dynamics problem. And then another uh, example where we can do lattice Boltzmann modeling, it's basically laboratory tests uh, on micro models, which they're doing up on the third floor. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen it in the lab there. They have this microscope and they film the fluid flow going through the uh, small pores. I have a video of that in the next slide. Uh, another more industrial way of using it is by taking 3D images of the core and then using that, uh, basically the map of the pore space, you run a simulation to get the flow through the pore geometry. By doing that, you can uh, extrapolate the rel perm data without actually having to do the measurement. And that's pretty interesting. There are some companies that have done it. There's one in, uh, in what is it called? Miracle Rocks uh, here in Trondheim, but they went, went under or bought up or something. <laughs> so here I just have a short video um, of the micro model up on the third floor. So we have oil in the system, and the blank stuff here is basically the rock. Okay, And there's going to be flow coming from the right. So this is hopefully what we can try to, try to simulate in a while. I think Ifon has to work on it a bit longer before he can do this. So it takes a while before uh, it comes in, but now you can see the water is flowing. You get this fingering effect. Then after that happens, you have the, you know, the bubbles moving through the, uh, the throats into the pore space. It's a pretty complicated system to try to simulate, and um, kind of the, the big challenge for, for LBM doing this. OK, but before we can do anything about uh, lattice Boltzmann modeling, we kind of have to start with the basics. So uh, a cellular autonoma is basically just a, a program where you, you put in a set of uh, input data. So like, imagine you had um, you know, a set of particles like this. 
and they can be either on or off. So it's one if it's on, and it's zero if it's off. And based on the particle you're looking at and its neighbors, based on whether or not the neighbors and itself is on or off, it will say something about the next state in time. So this will decide, you know, if this is zero, this is zero, this is one, then based off of some law or list, then we're gonna get out a value either zero or one. Okay? So the concept is very, very simple. You're just taking in the information about, you know, where you're at and your neighbors. And based off of that, change. Uh, you guys have probably seen the Conway's Game of Life animation. I know you did it in the beginning of the semester. That's an example of a cellular autonomous. So there you have rules about, you know, overpopulation, dying of loneliness, and, you know, having enough neighbors and you can reproduce. That's the same type of thing. You have a set of laws or a list, and based on, based on those uh, laws, you can predict the next time step. So here I have an example. We have, you know, a string of zeros and ones, and we have our laws. Okay? So you have here, the input value here is zero, zero, zero. So we put that into our law for our function. And we look through our list. Where do we have zero, zero, one? That's here. And it gives us the output. Give it a value of one. And then we have zero, one, zero. We find it here. We use the output, zero. And that's all fine and dandy, but I mean, does it really give us anything in, like, interesting or of importance? And the fact of the matter is that actually you do. You can get pretty, pretty sophisticated, uh, let me just, pretty sophisticated uh, results based off of this. So here I made a simple code. First I defined, uh, defined what my left center and right position is. Then I say, what are my laws? But I made a separate function here, just to list the laws that I'm looking through. I initiate it, and I set my middle point to be alive, and all the other points to be dead. You think, well, that's not going to give you much. But then, you know, we have to add boundary conditions, but then we're just going to let this run for a period of time. So do you think something is going to happen? Do you think, well, Maybe I'll get a string, or maybe a particle will shoot off in each direction. How complicated can it get? And if we run it, runs, there you go. What you get. So based off of the set of rules and the input or the initial conditions, you get a repeating pattern, Sapinski triangle. And if you let this go infinitely wide and infinitely far down, you would get the Sierpinski triangle. Okay? So there's a whole bunch of these uh, different laws. Based on the laws, you can get different um, interesting patterns. Okay? So do you feel like you have a somewhat understanding of what a cellular, a cellular autonomy is? Just you're gridding it up. You're saying it's dead or alive based off of that, and a set of rules or list, then you can say what the next time step is. Yes? It can be whatever you want. But based on what the law is, it will give you a certain outcome. So that's the thing, is that you can, you can make your laws describe a system that's real. So your laws could be uh, entangled with, for example, energy conservation and momentum conservation. And then what you're going to get is a, a simulation of a gas. So that's what we're going to do in the lattice gas uh, cellular autonomy, is that we, we base the laws on physical principles or conservation laws. 
and then we can get an output which should make sense, or at least it, it upholds the laws. And the reason that this got so big uh, back in the day was there were some crazy physicists during the time of quantum mechanics and into string theory and or advanced theories. They started thinking about uh, our universe is just a set of discretized voxels, so three-dimensional pixels. And they said, well, we can make these interesting patterns using just bits of information. Maybe if we have a set of you know, a laws or a list for our universe, three dimensions, that will recreate our physics based on a very simple list of laws. Caveat, but uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one one point that I would like to make here uh, before we go on is that when we're using zeros and ones, there's no round off error. There's no ambiguity, and there's it was basically no error. And we can, we can basically, um, the way of going from the law to the next time step is important. Because you can either make the long list of all the possible configurations, those, that list might be really long. But then, being smart, using some sort of a polynomial or, or something like that, you can you more quickly find the solution in the code. Just uh, something that, that is important, but you probably don't need to think about. Okay, so now we're going over to, to the lattice gas, cellular autonomous. And to divide the just the phrasing up, we have a lattice. That means that we we basically were gridding up our system. We're saying, you know. We have some grid. And we only allow the velocities for the movement to happen along that grid. We might have a Cartesian grid like this with eight directions plus, you know, the standing still. Or we could have a, another grid which looks more like this which would have only six directions to move along. And it will have an impact, but we're basically, we're, we're discretizing the direction. That's where the lattice part is coming in. And the gas part is by saying that we have few particles so that, yeah, or we're basically saying that there's not really an interaction between the particles. So we're, the only way, uh, two particles can interact with each other is by colliding elastically. Okay, so we're not losing any energy. The particles are not losing any velocity due to vibrations or anything like that. So the way I like to think about it is a pool table where you have a set of initial values you can, you know, after you, you split. All the the um, pool balls, they have they have to have a certain velocity. We're going to set that equal to some unit velocity. So they all have the same velocity. And as I've drawn it here, it only has a certain amount of direction. So the particles are only moving with 45 degree. Uh, yeah, so you can rotate by 45 degrees. And then we have the time zero uh, system. We know where all the particles are and we know their velocity in each direction. So what you're going to see is there's one ball that's hugging the wall, but it has the velocity in that direction. And here we have a collision. And this shows uh, the boundary condition of our model, what it should be, and what a collision should look like. And all the rest of them, they're just going to continue in that same direction for a certain period delta t. And 
they won't really do anything. They're just going to stream along their direction. So if you see here now, the ball hitting the uh, boundary, it's going to bounce off and change direction. But the balls that are colliding, they're going to change direction. They're still going to be along the lattice direction. Okay? But you notice here that they didn't collide and go straight back. Because that's very unlikely. If you've ever tried to play pool, you know, you're going to, you try to hit the ball so that it goes like this and goes back. It's not really going to happen. Either you're going to hit it and you're going to stop. That's not going to be an elastic collision. So what's most likely going to happen is that they're going to go in a different direction. But the main thing is that we have to conserve momentum. So the net momentum in the collision has to be zero because you have one particle coming in, one the same mass from each side with the velocities kind of in opposite direction. So the momentum is zero. And you also need to conserve the energy, which is the same as counting the number of arrows. Okay, so now we have our two laws. We have the law of con uh, conservation of mass, uh, of uh, conservation of momentum and energy. So then we try to make this into a, basically a set of lists. But before we do that, I just wanted to give a illustration of how you can actually simulate a gas by using balls. Okay, to give you some motivation. And the way to do that, here. So here we have uh, some metal balls. It's played in slow motion. On the bottom here, we're vibrating. So we, we're kind of giving the particles the energy that they're losing to sound and heat and all this stuff. And on top here, we have a restriction or a mass. And we're adding more and more mass. And what's going to happen is that it's going to go down. Our volume is shrinking. So like in the I ideal gas law, the pressure is going to increase. And you see that by the fact that these particles are, are moving more erratically. You're getting more collisions per time period. So I think it, it really nicely illustrates that even on a large scale, we can try to simulate the effects of a gas by having uh, solid balls colliding elastically or somewhat elastically. OK. So I said here we have to choose a grid. And the simplest possible grid to use is a six-directional grid. So we can either go right or left, up to the right, up to the left, down to the left, down to the right. So I'm going to use east and west, and then you know, northeast, northwest, just for simplicity. And I'm going to describe this by using a vector down here. And the vector is going to have value 1 if we have a particle moving in that direction, and 0 if it doesn't have a particle moving in that direction. Okay, So an empty grid cell is just going to be zeros, a uh, string of zeros, the vector. So this here is the um, direction of not moving any direction. Sounds a bit weird, but that's the direction that it has. A is moving from this point to A, E1. That's saying, do we have a particle moving east? And it's either yes or no, either 0 or, or 1 or 0. And we do that for all the directions. And this is going to be our input into our law. So based, in, based on this input, we're going to have a specific output that has to conserve our energy, and conserve our momentum. Okay? And of course, just stop me if something is not. 
So, yeah, good. The last two points here, we want to we want to implement the um, solid node, basically. So if you have a, a boundary condition or if you have an obstruction where you want the particle to go and bounce back, that's where this S comes in. It stands for solid. And if it's zero, then we're going to have our normal collision. But if it's one, then we're going to have our bounce back criteria. And the R stands for random. So in a case like this, we're going to get more into it um, soon. Let's say we have a particle moving northeast and southwest as the input before the collision. Well, we said that the likelihood of it going back in the same direction is very small. So it can either go like this, or it can go like that. So there are two possible outcomes to the one input. So the R is going to be random 0 or 1. And we're going to update that. We're going to give it a random value each time we have to collide. And that's going to tell us whether to go in this direction afterwards or this direction. Okay. Good. Catch. Anything else? Okay. So I think we can get through the gridding just before we have a, or we have to 12. So we have 15 minutes. Yeah. So. When I was gridding this up, I just looked at one node and its direction. One of the reasons why we would choose this uh, hexagonal the cell, as they call it, is because here all the velocities have the same uh, magnitude. It all has a unit velocity. But translating this into a full grid is going to lead us to something that looks like this. So it's basically a Cartesian grid where everything is shifted. So the points are halfway between. So these points, this point here is halfway between these two points. That's the way I look at it. And this is important because a computer can't really process a map that has shifted coordinates. So we have to shift it back to uh, Cartesian coordinates in some way so that our computers can process it and understand, you know, how am I going to set up my rules? How am I going to solve for my rules? So on and so forth. And this leads us to a, a coordinate transform. So we're basically shifting these two rows here to the left so that they're synchronized. But this is going to deform our cell. So the, the node that was northeast is now direct, directly north, and so on. And this is key to actually being able to implement this idea into code. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to have two separate calculations, or solving for your lists, or solving for your collisions based on if you're in, on an odd row or an even row. And it's, it's kind of a detail, but it's very important if you actually want to try to, to implement this. And it's also going to have a, an effect in that a movement straight up here, it's going to be the same thing as a movement like this. But that doesn't really happen because you can either go, if you only had one particle, it would either go like that or like that. So having a movement going straight up here doesn't really work. The way it's going to go, it's just going to go something like this is going to be. Yeah, so it's going to go up, right, up, right. It's just 
so you know that when you're when you're doing your uh, QC of your code that it's going to do something weird. But it works because it's actually a different grid. Okay? So just to, do, to go through it again, imagine you have an input, which is like this. You have a particle coming in like that, drawn as an arrow here, and a particle coming in like this, drawn as an arrow like that. This is the way we draw it. But we have to tell it to the computer, so we give it as a, uh, a vector of information, 0 or 1. So we have no particle in the middle. We have a particle moving to the right and a particle moving to the left. And looking at my, my random node, I can decide what my output is going to be. And it's also going to be a, a vector with either zeros or ones. OK, so, so this is how you would set up a set of rules. And you have to do this for every single possible configuration. You're going to have a, a long list, a very long list of inputs, which is going to have a direct correlation to a long list of outputs. Okay? And here is the second case. And the only thing that's different is this value here. Now it's 1. The directions change. And this is, this is basically how you would write it up if you were going to write down the, the list of input values correlated to the list of output values. And it's going to be very, very long. And uh, trying to figure out a way of doing this efficiently, either by having an, a very efficient uh, search algorithm here or by uh, using some other clever method is key to making this code run at any time that would be sufficient. If not, you're just going to be spending a lot of time. Yes? So you, you make a, either you get Ifan to send you his PowerPoint, where he has, he's done all the figures for all the configurations. So he's gone through, this is the one case, then this is the other case. And then you have to, say, well, what if my input value was like that, right? So you're going to get two cases. What if my input value was like that? You get two cases. And then you go to the third one. So if you say you add one like that, that's going to be a new list or new law. So you have to basically go from 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And you have to individually, well, you can make it go faster. You'll, you'll find the patterns when you're working on it. But in theory, you would have to go through each case, draw it up, and then write down the corresponding uh, input and output vector. So that's based on the conservation of energy and momentum. So in this case, I have two arrows, right? Two ones on, on this part. So my output has to have two arrows. That's conservation of energy, right? But I could have one arrow going down and one arrow going like this. But then you would have a, a net momentum going down. Then you would go from zero net no momentum to a momentum greater than zero, or different. So the, you can make the list however you want, but you have to base it on the two conservation laws. And that's how you make it. Okay. So I think we can try to, to just to illustrate to make
So if we have a case where we have net momentum, it's very easy because then it has to be the same thing on the way out. Nothing can really change, right? Unless you have some something canceled. So if this was your input, the vector would be, let's say we have no solid node, so zero, or not, I mean, no uh, node moving in no direction. And then we would have one going to the east, so it would be one. Northeast, so it would be one. Zero. Zero, zero, zero. And then let's just say zero and zero. Okay? So this would be our input vector. And then we would have to think, well, I have to conserve the amount of arrows that I have. That's my energy. So I have to have two arrows. And my momentum has to go something like that. So I can't move it anywhere else because then the momentum is going to change. Direction and magnitude. So the only possible output is going to be that. Okay, and then what you then what I tell you to do is is basically just turn this around like a clock, because now you know that for, for this type of system, then you're just going to get the same output. So then you know that for all this uh, the, the possible configurations where you move this around, is you're just going to have the same output. And then you can go on. So let's say instead of having this. We have, so this is right up. Yeah. Now we have, uh, let's see if this is right. Yeah, let's do this. Okay. So we have one particle going to the right before the collision, one particle going up, one going down to the left, one going left. Then what's our output going to be? Just by looking at it. It has to have four arrows, and the momentum is um, zero. So I think that in this case, and you might have to correct me, I I put the output like this. So this 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 Okay? Because here we also have net momentum of 0 and we have the same amount of arrows so the energy is conserved. That might be my rule. I'm not sure can you get the same output here? So if you if you have this one here, will you have can is is going to have two outputs or one? Yeah, but you can't. You can have two, right? Because you can have either the same, or you can have it shifted, or oh no, sorry, you can have it like this or. So you're thinking, or, yeah, yeah. So here you're going to have two cases. So then you're going to have to use the R. No. Yes, that, that, that's the same as uh, when you have this. You don't allow it to bounce straight back because you say that the probability of that is so small. Yes. But it would be in, it would be indistinct it would be indistinguishable from going straight back. And and it's because of that that you can only have it I mean you you can make a set of laws that 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 does allow you to go straight back. Mhm. Mm 
like that, and opposite, yes. But there will be no way to distinguish. And, and, and the, yes, it's possible physically, but in the mathematics, the people who did this more rigorously, they show that then this type of thing won't simulate a gas anymore. And it has to do with the configuration, because the configuration in and the configuration out that you're actually using, the, the, the bit underneath, is, is more complicated and it's more rigorous than the, the figures. So it's a simplification using the figures to get the laws. Yes. You will always have two, but the two can be the same. Okay? Okay, so now, now you see how I would go down and, and go through every scheme and, and make it. And this is something you can do, or you can ask very kindly to Ifan, and he's made the pictures, and he's made the, the, the map, or the bits, the vector. Okay? And then I'd like to talk about the bounce back criteria. And this is one possible bounce back criteria that I, I've set up. So you have the whole thing is divided into two parts. You can either, you're either streaming, that means moving along the direction. So you're going from one node to another. And then once you've come to this point here, then you're the input to the law. And that's the same as the law is the collision telling you what's happening. So you have free stream. You have a particle moving towards this node. Post stream, you're going to be at this node. And if this was, and then you have a law or a condition for the determining what the output is going to be. And in this case, I've made the bounce back criteria so that it's going to bounce up to the left. Okay? This is one possible configuration, and it looks very trivial. But you can discuss, because of the fact that you have this weird gridding, then doing this, go back here. So what I'm saying is that going from here to here, if this was a solid node, then I would go here. Okay? And that's the same as saying if I go here to here, and this was a solid node, then I would go here. But you could make the argument that you would bounce straight back. And, I, and I'm pretty sure that's what they do in the book as well. So what they're saying is that you can go, when you go from here to here, then you go back here it's a solid node. So if you have a, a, like a boundary, and you're flowing into the boundary, then you always bounce back. But it's up to you. It's, you can try both of them out, and they'll probably give you different results. But the, the main output is what's happening in the non-boundary points. Because I, I, I think that in my code, I implemented this bounce back criteria in a different way than this, so that my particle bounces straight back. But it, you know, that's the whole part of this, is that it, you're, you make a set of lists or laws, and then you see what the outcome is, and then you can tweak it to make it fit reality, or fit reality better. Yes, so in the hexagonal But you can have, um, you don't need to have a staggered boundary. You're only going to have a staggered boundary on the left and the right. But on the top, it's straight. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, I mean, I could, um, and, and that's the thing is that you can change the law or the list, however you want. And then you can come with an argument like that, a physical argument saying, well, you want there to be no flow at the boundary, for example. And then having a bounce back that goes straight back will help you get that. 
you get a no flow boundary with a simple model like this. Because if a particle comes in then, then it's going to be restricted by the, the bounce back. But if you're continuing like that, then your momentum is going to be the same direction. So you won't have a, a no slip condition. Okay? And yeah, it's one o'clock now. Do you guys want to break? Yeah, small break, coffee break. <laughs>